would like to first acknowledge my collaborators, but they are not responsible for my mistakes. <laughs> what is the relationship between your brain and your conscious experiences? This is a question that has troubled philosophers for centuries. About 150 years ago, Thomas Huxley was worried about this question, and he said, we understand as much about how brain activity causes conscious experiences as we do about how Aladdin came out of the lamp when it was rubbed. That was the analogy he made 150 years ago. We've learned a lot about the brain and the correlations between brain activity and conscious experiences in the years since Huxley. We know dozens, perhaps hundreds, of neural correlates of consciousness. But we're no closer to solving this mystery. In fact, science, the journal, just a few years ago, put this question as the number two unsolved problem in science. What is the relationship between your brain and your conscious experiences? We don't just have no theories about it. We don't have any good ideas. So the question is, perhaps we're making a false assumption. And I want to check that false assumption. I think that most of us assume that we've been shaped by evolution to see reality as it is. So when you look and have an experience that you describe as seeing a red tomato a meter away, we assume that even when we close our eyes and our experience changes to just a gray field, that there's still a red tomato a meter away in front of us. But is it possible that we've made a mistake here? Is it possible that when we open our eyes and we have an experience of a red tomato a meter away, we're interacting with some reality, but that reality is arbitrarily different from what we experience. Similarly, if we see a lion or, and here's the kicker, neurons and brains. It might be that when we look inside heads and see neurons and brains, we are interacting with a reality that's objective, that would exist whether or not we were looking, but it's nothing like neurons and brains, and that therefore the idea that neurons and brains cause our experiences is just plain false. How can we address this question in a scientific manner. Well, if we assume that, whoops, going back, that our senses are a product of evolution by natural selection, then evolution provides us with mathematical tools to answer this question. What is the probability that we've evolved perceptions that are shaped to see reality as it is? It's a clean mathematical question. We don't have to raise our hands. And we've looked at this question. We've run simulations, millions of simulations, in which we create artificial worlds, in which there are different kinds of resources, randomly chosen, with different fitness functions that I'll talk about in a moment, and, and organisms that can compete in these worlds for the resources. We can give some organisms complete knowledge. They can, their perceptions see truth as it is in the world, and other organisms see none of the truth. They're only tuned to fitness, but they see nothing about the reality as it is. And we can let them compete and ask what survives, what dominates, and what goes extinct, which perceptual strategies work. A key notion is the notion of fitness in evolution. Um, what is the fitness consequences of a stake for an, an animal? Well, it depends on the animal. If you're a lion that's hungry, looking to eat, then that stake could really enhance your fitness quite a bit. If you're a, a, lion, if you're a rabbit and then you stay, it won't help you. <laughs> right? And, and if you're a lion that's full and looking to mate, it won't do you any good either. So the key notion of fitness and evolution is that fitness is a function of whatever reality is, but also of the organism, its state, and its action. So fitness and truth are utterly different things. And evolution is quite clear. It's fitness and not truth that gives you the points you need to win in the evolutionary game. So, We've actually then run these simulations, and what we find is quite simple. Organisms that see the truth go extinct. When they compete against organisms that don't see any of the truth at all, literally none of the truth at all, and are just tuned to the fitness function. But there's a theorem that was recently proven by Chaitan Prakash now, which basically says, says this. The, the probability that an organism seeing the truth can defeat an organism that sees none of the truth, that is just tuned to fitness, um, is is basically just a, a um, random chance, and the chance goes to zero as the organisms get more complicated. So 
two organisms of equal complexity, one that sees truth, one that sees fitness, the one that sees truth will go extinct when it competes against an organism that sees fitness. So it's no longer just simulations, we have a theorem. So how shall we understand our perceptual systems then? I mean, most of us intuitively think that our perceptions are useful because they're true. How could they be useful to us if they're not true? And the analogy I like is the analogy of a desktop user interface. Suppose you're editing a file, and that file is, has an icon on the desktop that's blue and rectangular and in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, as you see here. Does that mean that the file itself in the computer is blue, rectangular, and in the lower right-hand corner of the computer? Clearly not. Anybody who thought that misunderstands the purpose of the desktop interface. It's not there to show you the reality of the computer. In fact, quite the opposite. It's there to hide that. You don't want to know about the diodes and resistors and megabytes of software, the voltages, and, and if you had to know all that, good luck editing your file. You couldn't do it. So the point of the interface is first to hide the truth. You don't need to know it. In fact, it gets in the way. And second, it's there to give you eye candy that lets you get done what you need to get done. So the idea is that evolution has shaped us with an interface that hides reality. And that's its purpose, in part, is to hide reality. 3D space, as you perceive it in this room right now, is just your desktop for the species Homo sapiens. And physical objects are just, and, and particles, electrons and protons and so forth, are just icons in that desktop. They're not there to show you the truth. They're there to guide adaptive behaviors. So that's the key idea here. We've evolved an interface that's species specific. Different species will have different interfaces. They won't see reality as we do. Through, they'll see it through their own interfaces. The obvious objection is Hoffman. If you think that train coming down the track is just an icon of your interface, why don't you step in front of it? And after you're gone and your stupid theory with you, we'll know that the <laughs> There's more to the train than just being an icon. And, and you'll be happy to know I wouldn't step in front of the train for the same reason I wouldn't drag that, let's see if I can get it back, drag that icon to the trash can carelessly. If I drag that icon to the trash can carelessly, thing, bad things can happen. I could lose a year of work. So I don't take the icon literally. The file is not blue and rectangular, but I do take it seriously. Careless usage of that icon could cause me trouble. I could lose something. So evolution has given us icons that have been shaped to keep us alive. We better take them seriously. But that does not mean we have to take them literally. And that's the logical error we make. We have to take them seriously, but we don't have to take them literally. One more objection. Well, our perceptions are quite accurate. We've just put rovers on Mars. How can we possibly be that accurate in our, you know, shooting things to Mars, putting GPS satellites around the Earth, if we're not seeing the truth. And it turns out we have a theorem that says it doesn't matter how accurate your perceptions are, how much you can predict exactly what your actions will, will do to your perceptions, um, no matter what group you, you're dealing with of, of, of symmetries that you can interact with the world, it, it turns out that that perception, action, accuracy that you have entails nothing about the structure of the world except technically it puts a lower bound on the number of its states. So it's a theorem that our accuracies and the fact that we can put rovers on Mars tells us nothing about the nature of reality as it is except to put a lower bound on its complexity. So the idea then is that evolution has shaped us with an interface such that when you do see a tomato as your experience, you are interacting with some reality, but it's not like a tomato at all. And the same thing with the brain. So, what is the nature of that reality? Well, I'm proposing along the lines of, of what Henry Sapp was talking about actually, that consciousness is at the fundamental nature of reality. The idea, same intuitions that Henry was talking about, we have our perceptual experiences, which um, can, we can use to guide our actions, and those actions change the state of the world. And the idea is that we can then take these intuitions and mathematize it. So we have conscious experiences, we make decisions, 
We take actions based on those decisions, and those actually have consequences in the world. Let's just formalize that intuition and see if we can go from there. Very, very simple. And so we have a mathematical structure that um, is just a, a six-tuple. I won't go into the mathematics of it, but it's a completely formal structure. And um, so we have this thing called a conscious agent is entirely rigorously specified, mathematically precise, the point being to be precise so that we can show precisely why we're wrong, so we can then make the next model that's different and not wrong in that way, but maybe wrong in a different way. So the idea is to always be precise so you can be shown by others precisely why you're wrong. So I won't go into the mathematics of this, but the proposal then is that every aspect of consciousness can be modeled by systems of conscious agents. That, that's a falsifiable thesis. If someone can find an aspect of consciousness, some property of consciousness that cannot be modeled by this formalism, then I'm wrong. And the conscious realism thesis um, says the world consists of conscious agents. So the idea is, this, the proposal is that what exists in reality is not space-time and physical objects, the hard impenetrable particles that, that Henry Stapp was talking about. That's, I agree with him, that's not the nature of reality. What instead exists are conscious agents and only conscious agents. And space-time and particles and so forth are just the user interface that some conscious agents to represent, that they use it to represent their interactions with other conscious agents. One clean constraint on such a theory is that it must give us back physics as we know it today, as a special case. So to try to solve this mind-body problem, it's traditionally been that we start with the brain and try to get consciousness. We start with unconscious ingredients and try to get consciousness coming out. We've not made any progress. So I'm suggesting start the other way. Have a mathematically rigorous theory of consciousness and from that mathematical model, get back precisely supersymmetric quantum theory, quantum gravity, and make new predictions. And without going into the mathematics, I'll, I'll just say that there are directions that we're going in which we can actually connect interactions of pairs of conscious agents. This little graphic is a pair of conscious agents interacting. And we can connect them with cleanly with the mathematics of space-time conformal supersymmetric models of, of quantum mechanics, uh, Dirac spinners, and, and Penrose twisters. We can also do that with the, uh, another aspect of the same model. There's a, a, one that leads to space-time and one that leads to its dual. And I'll just end with a little speculation. Um, there's recent work by Nima Arkani Ahmed and others on something called the amplituhedron. It turns out that He's going around, and you can see YouTube videos in which he's saying, space-time is doomed. Physicists are saying space-time is doomed. Why? Because when you actually try to compute scattering amplitudes, like at the Large Hadron Collider, two you know, gluons come in, four go spraying out, you try to compute the probabilities. If you do it in space-time, you get 80 pages of algebra, and it's almost impossible to compute. If you go outside of space-time, you get a structure that's got a much deeper symmetry, not in space and time, it's outside of space and time, and the equations jump down to about something you can do with paper and pencil, two or three terms instead of 80 pages. So when you do everything in space time, you get an ugly result and you lose insight into deeper symmetries of nature. But when you step outside of space time, you get these deeper symmetries and much uh, easier computations. And my goal is to make connections between this theory of conscious agents um, qua conscious agents, not as you know, you know, fundamentally from physics, just on their own. So eight conscious agents not in space and time, and show that we can get space-time projections that give us back supersymmetry and its dual, and, and essentially make a connection at the amplitude of And that gives me one minute left for, for any questions. Yes? Why would evolution shape us with perceptions that hide reality? Two or three reasons. First, reality is irrelevant to your survival. Knowing reality is irrelevant to your survival in the following sense. If you, 
fitness, as I mentioned with that steak example, it's only about getting fitness points. So that if you, if you get the, the fitness points more than your competitors, you will actually outcompete your competitors. So in the case of the desktop, for example, when I say you don't need to know reality, you don't need to know the diodes and resistors and all the software inside the computer. All you need to know is how to, to deal with the icons on the desktop. That's all you need to know. So that's what's happened with us. Um, we've got perceptions that have been designed. They've given us a desktop that allows us to stay alive. One way to put it very briefly is, Perception is not about seeing truth, it's about having kids from an evolutionary point of view, right? It's, it was, it's been shaped so that you'll have kids. So those whose perceptual systems made it more likely that they would have kids passed on the genes for their perceptual systems that made it more likely to have kids. But those who had perceptual systems that endowed them with truth didn't. Is that changing? Um, well, my, my work with evolutionary games and in particular genetic algorithms makes me believe that at no point in evolutionary history on this planet has any organism at any point ever seen reality as it is. So it's, uh, I think it's the same story all along, simply because um, seeing the truth is just not fit enough. So I don't think it's, not, it's changing. Although if anything's changing, what we do know about human brains is that over the last 30,000 years, our brains have shrunk. So we've lost a tennis ball size of brain tissue in our, in our cerebral cortex um, over the last 30,000 years. So if anything, we're going the other direction than we thought. Okay. Other questions? Time for one more or no? One more? Okay. Okay. So um, when you said that um, there's been no beings that understand reality or truth as it is, does that include um, you know, Buddhas and Christ, I mean, um, avatar type beings who supposedly have reached that place of Good question. Truth? So there's a distinction between seeing with your perceptual systems reality as it is versus having a cognitive understanding of, of reality. And so the work that I've done has, that I presented today is only on the evolution of perceptual systems. That doesn't mean that we couldn't have other avenues where we might actually get access. So for example, logic and mathematics, when I've been starting to analyze those from the point of view of evolution, it's not clear that the, the pressures from natural selection are uniformly against truth. That there are situations in which um, it actually makes sense that we would have at least certain areas where we can have limited good reason, limited good logic, limited good mathematics. So which is good because otherwise I would have actually refuted myself. If I showed that evolution shows that no theory is worth, its, you know, is worth taking into account, then that would mean I've proved my own theory is not worth taking into account, which is... So, so it actually works out pretty well. So we have to look at each cognitive capacity one at a time. So perception, I'm very, very clear. We've been not shaped to see reality as it is. We've been shaped to see an interface. Other cognitive capacities we have to look at one at a time and see what evolution says. Yes. Okay, thank you.